Part One. You will hear a conversation between two people, a student and a professor. The student is talking to the professor related to his scores, which are not up to the mark. You have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, ma'am. Can I have a word with you if you are free? Good morning. Yes. Tell me. Ma'am, ma I'm unable to understand why my scores are so low, in despite the fact that I had worked hard. Hmm. I saw your marks. You did not score well in history and science. What is the reason? Are you facing any difficulty in the class, or are you unable to understand the respective subject teachers? No, ma'am. I have no problem in understanding in the class, and I do not take much leaves. I attend my classes regularly. My notes are always complete, and I sit in the front row of my class. Then where is the problem? Even though my notes are complete, but when I am revising the material, I am unable to understand my own notes. I feel I am lost. Now that's the problem. I think you just write your notes in the class without concentrating. I believe you should review your notes soon after your class gets over. You should not delay in reviewing. You may do it during the class break, which you get and make corrections. And if you fail to understand, then you can ask from the respective subject teacher during the next class. You will be able to seek all clarifications. Basically, you should be connected with your notes on daily basis. Don't give a gap. Such kind of follow-up will make your learning more consistent and confident. That is a very nice advice. I will surely review my notes on a regular basis. And also, I would like to tell you that I feel tired in the evening. I face difficulty in concentrating while studying. Hmm. You should make a timetable and then study. Take a short break after every one or two hours. Never study continuously for more than two hours. Take small time out, and very important is that you should sleep for at least seven hours daily, as it keeps your mind and body healthy. Rest will help you in removing clutters in your mind. I just didn't know about that. I think I've been exerting myself. Maybe that is the reason all my efforts are giving me no results. I will listen to your advice and make a proper time schedule, which will include seven hours of sleep daily. Thank you so much, ma'am. You are welcome. Take care of your health and wish you all the best. Now you will hear a conversation between the professor and the counsellor. Look at questions six to ten. As the talk continues, answer questions six to ten. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, ma'am. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Actually, I wanted to speak about something with you. Yeah, sure. Why not? What is it about? I have been noticing for a while that some students, even though are sincere towards their studies, but are still unable to score good marks in their subjects. Yes. Even I noticed the same, and I have already started working on it. I'll be organising a counselling session and workshop for all students, and good suggestions will be provided. So, what kind of workshops are you planning to organise? I've planned workshops for students who are interested in meditation and importance of entertainment. Hmm, meditation. Meditation for those students whose mind is not at rest and who find difficulty in concentrating. And what kind of entertainment stuff? Guiding students to watch some comedy channels, it is a kind of stress buster, as you see young children are more relaxed because they watch cartoons. That is an interesting method. Hope this benefits the students. I believe 
but it will surely help the students to focus and have a relaxed mind and not a casual attitude. I agree. Okay, see you. I have to go to my class. Okay, ma'am. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear some motivational tips on the topic "small steps to success" given by Mr. Moss, who is a professor of management science. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen to the recording and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Too much success seems to come suddenly. When you observe others and what they have achieved, you usually don't appreciate what it's taken for them to get where they are. Ultimately, in failing to do this, you also fail to learn what it would take for you to attain the level of achievement and success. But if you take the time to truly think about it, you will find that success is usually only a small step away. Yet, despite that, it eludes most people. It is always so near and yet so far. As a part of our military training in the Air Force, we were given a very demanding assignment. We were put into groups of about ten and taken to some unknown location far in the bush. After a few days of camping there and doing some military maneuvers, we were told to head back to the base. Now, this time, we wouldn't be driven back. We would have to track back. We had only a few things to carry. A liter of water each for the whole trip, and an AK-47 rifle with one round of ammunition. So we started off that day at sunset, walking through the thick bush. Because we were using a compass for direction, we had to walk in a straight line back to the base. Any slight deviation from the path, and we would inevitably have gotten lost. That meant that whatever obstacle we encountered on the way had to be overcome. That straight line had to be maintained at all costs. Worse still. We had no light. We were basically walking blind in the moonless night, so you could not see where your next step was going to land. But we had to walk fast. Our deadline was at twelve noon the next day to be at the base, or else we would have failed the assignment. So we walked through the night. There was no time for fear, no time for doubt. We had to do what we had to do. Our futures depended on it. Finally, we could go no further. The pain and fatigue was unbearable. We had to catch a nap. It was past midnight. One hour of sleep, all cuddled up like puppets for warmth, and then we moved on. Soon the morning bells rang, but there was no time to appreciate the sunrise. It was so hot you could feel the heat embracing your face. We were getting dehydrated. By now, everyone was wishing they had not had to carry the heavy AK-47. It seemed to have gained an extra five kilo since we'd begun. Every step was accompanied by some pain in one part of the body or other. Every part of the body was crying out for attention, but we had to move on. Small steps to success. We were as dry and shrivelled as prunes. We were a sorry sight for defence officers, but right then it was more about survival than about dignity. Finally, a few minutes to midday, we arrived at the base. I had no idea I could stink so bad. Now look at questions seventeen to twenty.
As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. So, you see we took small steps to success all along that track. Together, they added up to hundreds of thousands of small steps. But we might have chosen not to take the first step. We might have stopped at any point along the way. That would have meant that we would not have got to our destination. There were also obstacles along the way. But with each small step, they were overcome. There were frustrations, fears and uncertainties. But with each small step, they were crushed. There was hardship and danger. But with each small step and focus on the desired destination, it was conquered. So you see, success is no mystery. It takes only one step to succeed. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will listen to an interview with Dr. Temple Grandin, who is in a unique position to provide parents and professionals insight into autism because she had autism. She was diagnosed at the age of two and has lived a very challenging and adventurous life. Dr. Grandin has presented lectures on autism around the world and has appeared on many national television programs. The interview is conducted by Dr. Stephen Edelson. Now you have some time to look at questions. Listen to the interview conversation and answer questions. What is your earliest recollection and how old were you? I was in a summer program when I was just a real little child, about three. I can remember playing around in a wading pool. When I was three and a half years old, I can also remember quite a few things. I can remember the frustration of not being able to talk. I knew what I wanted to say, but I could not get the words out, so I would just scream. I can remember this very clearly. I can remember a time when I was in speech therapy in nursery school. The teacher was using a blackboard pointer to point to the students to do something, and I was just screaming every time she aimed the pointer at me. I screamed because I was taught at home that you should never point an object at a person because it could poke out your eye. What do you suggest to the parents who have autistic children? I am a big believer in early intervention. You've got to keep autistic children engaged with the world. You cannot let them tune out. Research is starting to show that a child should be engaged at least 20 hours a week. I do not think it matters which program you choose as long as it keeps a child actively engaged with a therapist, teacher or parent for at least 20 hours a week. Now look at questions. As the talk continues, answer questions. You are one of the first people in the field to stress the importance of sensory problems in autism. What are your current thoughts about this issue? I have been a big believer in making people aware of the sensory problems in autism, and these sensory problems are variable. Donna Williams wrote about a monochannel approach where she either has to listen to something or see something, but she cannot do both. I was the type of child where they could just jerk me out of autism by saying, now come on, pay attention. But you cannot do this to the children with more severe sensory problems. 
In these cases, you have to question whether there is a biological reason for the bad behavior or a behavioral reason. If sound hurts a child's ears, there is no way you can make him not be scared of the school bell. A mother who has a five and a half year old child with PDD wants advice. Her son attends a pre kindergarten classroom with 22 other students, and he's starting to become aggressive. The mother says that her child has selected a particular child in the classroom and places him in a chokehold position. I do not have enough information to give full advice. Since PDD and autism are strictly behavioral diagnoses, they are not absolute diagnoses, such as Down syndrome. The PDD label is used because he is affectionate and interested in people. These are two very different types of PDD labels. And they are like apples and oranges. Since the child is aggressive towards one particular child, we need to figure out why is this happening. Is the other child teasing him? In any case, a behavior intervention is needed to stop this behavior. Thank you, Doctor, for sparing your time and talking with us. It was a great pleasure in having a conversation with you. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture given by a geography lecturer to his students related to seahorse and its species. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Seahorse is the name given to 54 species of marine fishes in the genus Hippocampus. Hippocampus comes from the ancient Greek hippo, meaning horse, and kampos, meaning sea monster. Seahorses are mainly found in shallow tropical and temperate waters throughout the world and live in sheltered areas such as sea greases beds, estuaries, Coral reefs or mangroves. Four species are found in Pacific waters from North America to South America. In the Atlantic, H. erectus ranges from Nova Scotia to Uruguay. H. zostere, known as the dwarf seahorse, is found in the Bahamas. Colonies have been found in European waters, such as the Thames estuary. Three species live in the Mediterranean Sea H. gutuletus, in the long snouted seahorse, H. hippocampus, the short snouted seahorse. And H. fuscus, the sea pony. These species form territories. Males stay within one square meter habitat, while females range about 100 times that. Seahorses range in size from 1.5 to 35.5 centimeters. They are named for their equine appearance. Although they are bony fish, they do not have scales, but rather thin skin stretched over a series of bony plates, which are arranged in rings throughout their bodies. Each species has a distinct number of rings. Seahorses swim upright, another characteristic not shared by their close pipefish relatives, which swim horizontally. Razorfish are the only other fish that swim vertically, like a seahorse. Unusual among fish, a seahorse has a flexible, well defined neck. It also sports a coronet on its head, which is distinct for each individual. Seahorses swim very poorly. Rapidly fluttering a dorsal fin and using pectoral fins located behind their eyes to steer. The slowest moving fish in the world is H. zostere, the dwarf seahorse, with a top speed of 1.5 meter per hour. The earliest known seahorse fossil are of two pipefish like species, 
H. Sarmaticus and H. Slovenicus from the coprolytic horizon of Tungis Hills, a middle Miocene horizon of the Slovenia dating back about 13 million years. Molecular dating finds that pipefish and seahorses diverged during the late Oligocene. This has led to the speculation that seahorses evolved in response to large areas of shallow water newly created as the result of tectonic events. The shallow water would have allowed the expansion of seagrass habitats that selected for the camouflage offered by the seahorse's upright posture. These tectonic changes occurred in the Western Pacific Ocean, pointing to an origin there, where molecular data suggested two later separate invasions of the Atlantic Ocean. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.